Well, hey there, I'm actually live and my countdown timer worked. I just want to say thanks for all the you already who joined early, Paul Ulrich. Great to see you, man. That's that's great. Yeah. What a wonder. Uh, Marjorie's here. Motivation, Lou, you're hiding behind a mask. I'm sure I know who you are, but I can't tell with the picture. Um, welcome to my first official live stream. Hey, Kat. Hi, how you doing? I uh, actually have comments up over there. I got to test out these things. So you guys that are here first and that are that are, are helping me with this that are new, I get to check all of this this cool stuff out like um, I can pull up comments and um, hopefully this all works. See, this is the grand experiment, the first live stream. So if you detect that there's a, a problem, do let me know and I'm checking different comments. But I'll give you an example. Ulrich, want to see your comment? I'll just do that and I'll send it up. There it is. Ulrich, there's your comment and it'll disappear all by itself like magic. All these, uh, these things are pretty cool. Hi, Wendy. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, we're going to have a mix of people joining today. Some are um, friends of mine. Uh, many, most of you are friends of mine, uh, but uh, that, are, that know me um, through or even outside of photography. Some are students and apprentices and mentors, uh, people that I've met in the world of photography. And some of you I met through doing something we called LIDA in August. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that before I get to our topic for the day. But before I start, you know, uh, I see that people that do this really well say, hey, if you're new, say new in the comments, but, but technically you're all new to a brand new live stream. So if you all said new in the comments, it would get a little overwhelming, wouldn't it? Oh, uh, did I just see a poll in the comments too? Yeah. Um, <laughs> new, everybody's new today. It's so exciting. Everybody can say new. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ron Clifford and I am a, I tell people I'm a portrait photographer. I take portraits of people and I take portraits of nature and I help others to do the same because I'm also an educator and mentor. And these are the things that I can't help but do. These are the things that bring me life and joy. And so I suspect as this channel moves on, it'll have to do with three things, life, photography, and business. That's my teacher mode. See, when you put up the finger, life, photography. Did your teachers ever do that? <laughs> Mine always did. Oh, my favorite heckler is here. Hey, Gary, it's great to see you. Remember the early days of Google Plus, Gary, heckling and hangouts? It took you a long time. When was the first time you joined a hangout? 2019, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. That's just funny. So, yeah, that's who I am. And uh, one, of, one of the things I love to do is help people level up their their skills and overcome obstacles on their creative journey. And uh, very few things bring me quite as much joy as seeing somebody get it or move to a new level. And so that's just a little bit about me. Oh, I, I love, I'm looking down and I see these names pop up. Lori, hello, Lori Novak. So good to see you. And uh, Carmen, wow, so glad you're here. Kathy from Oklahoma City. Hi, Kathy. Glad you're here. Yeah, and um, yeah, let me know where you're from because I'm in uh, historic Newmarket, Ontario, Canada. Uh, sadly, in Ontario, we're, like many places in the world, we're seeing, I guess, what everybody is considering the, the second wave of the coronavirus of COVID-19. And so our numbers have spiked dramatically. Uh, yesterday, we recorded the highest number daily increase since we've been recording numbers uh, since March. So that's a little, uh, it's challenging. I, I think uh, I think we're going to be going through periods where we want to keep running life and running business. And on the other hand, we want to ensure that people are safe, especially our, our older and our vulnerable population, which so far with the new wave here in Ontario has not been hit as hard as the younger people. So that's a good thing. Um, I say um quite a bit. I'm going to get a de-ummer. I have show, a show flow, something I learned in Lita, which I'm going to talk about now. So uh, where did this all begin? So um, I'm not new to doing broadcast shows and, and doing 
uh, live video, but it's always with people in my room. And so I've had some people helping me out, getting me to the point where I felt more comfortable doing uh, Facebook or YouTube live. And so I, I spent August going live every day in something called Lita, live every day in August. There's another one coming in April called Live Every Day in April. And if you're thinking about doing live streaming of any kind or want to get over the jitters about going into uh, meetings and hangouts and, and doing video, I would suggest you go over to Live Streaming Pros. Uh, they're a, a great group of people, both on excuse me, Facebook and on YouTube. And I stumbled upon them one day. I was going through something because I was looking at live streaming and this live streaming thing came up and I, I, I caught the end of it or the replay. You know what? I think I caught the end of it live. So the last few minutes and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, live streaming pros and I was interested in live streaming and right away I joined um, this thing called Lita. It was a 30 day challenge to go live every day. I say, hey, I'm going to do that because one of the things I struggle with is going live to a camera without a room full of people. So I can present and I can do hangouts and Zoom calls and, and Skype calls quite comfortably. But I, I do struggle and have, have a lot more nervousness going live to uh, a camera. And so I appreciate your patience with me while I kind of get into the rhythm of that, I guess. It's, it's really hard. But all I have to, to think about it is, is Paul Burke telling a joke or Gary Monroe heckling, and I think we'll be OK. <laughs> um, I have comments over here and here, but I get to pull them. So that's, that's kind of cool. Oh. Yeah, CK Antics. Hey, CK. Um, good to see you. So I joined Lita and uh, I went live. Actually, the first day I didn't go live. The first day, I think day or two, I, I had to record it because I had no internet service and I, I wasn't where I could go live until uh, after the first day. And so I recorded, I think it was two, thir two minute, maybe two minute and 30 second live, my first recorded live because I break the rules. And in the end, I became far more comfortable having a theme or a topic, even a little bit of a flow, and then uh, hitting that live button and letting it go longer than three or five minutes. Uh. <laughs> oh, Gary and Marjorie and Lori all in the same room. I don't know. This, this could get un, un, unhinged, I think. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, do I have to? I got to see. Oh, there we go. Oh, I like that. I'm going to send that up. Send up a comment. See that? That's cool, eh, Lori? I can call up comments. Uh, and that's to Marjorie's comment here. Um, I'm going to end up getting a little bit, a little bit better technology. I wanted to start with, have you guys heard of the idea of minimum viable product? So I think for going live, your minimum viable product is actually your phone. And that's what I did first. And then I uh, started doing them a little better and uh, I got concerned about my background. And then I got a little bit better and I added my, my, uh, one of my higher quality cameras. And then I added, well, I had the microphone for a long time, but I have this microphone that, that helps me sound a little better than if I didn't. You know, the funny thing is, I, I, oh yeah, I did double check to make sure I was using the right microphone source. So hopefully I don't sound like I'm in a tin can. Art through the aperture photography. Oh, so, so glad you're here. Hey, welcome. All these people joining from their, 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 uh, their YouTube channels and uh, or YouTube pages, and so we don't get to see all the names. Paula Contreras, art art through the aperture. So that's the story. So by the end of August, I was feeling a lot more comfortable, and I had committed to starting a YouTube channel. Well, not starting it. I've had a YouTube channel for a long time. Uh, we, that's where we did the Photoshop show. You guys will remember uh, those that have followed me for a long time. And Life Through the Lens, one of the favorite shows I did. I met a lot of crazy interesting people on Life Through the Lens. And those were hangout broadcasts, what preceded YouTube Meet or Google Meet and YouTube Live and all those things. And so I have a level of comfort, but also a level of something's holding me back. So today, and I got to give special shout out to my happy insides. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, yeah, I know a few verified people, Kat. Uh, so my happy insights, Catherine and Paul Burke for um, throwing me off a cliff. 
uh, during an interview I did this week or last week with them. Oh, it was this week. It was only three days ago or two days ago. And hi, Rita. Oh, hi, Wave. I hope I didn't miss you. So Paul Burke and Catherine were responsible for pushing me off the cliff, like I do to most of my students. And so I, I had to begin to build the wings on the way down. <laughs> and hi, Valerie. A long time. We haven't talked in ages, Valerie. But thank you for tuning in. Um, so the story is I'm building the wings on the way down. And minimum viable product is using a, a streaming software, being able to call up comments, starting with just one camera, even though my end goal for all you photographers is to run a live or live workshops from my studio, multi-camera live workshops. And I could show you about lighting, natural lighting or headshots or beauty or, or whatever happens in the studio, I'm gonna be able to show you that. One of the first things I wanna do is add uh, a shadow cam for my little dog shadow. And I might use my, my, my phone and hook that up because I, I can do that. I just didn't want to add too much complication today because he often comes in and lies down and sleeps beside me. So this isn't my own idea. I actually got it from Luria from Live Streaming Pros. Thank you, Luria, for you have your little puppy cam. And uh, I thought, oh, that would be perfect because I have an, a senior dog who loves to sleep while I work. So uh, I'm going to get a shadow cam. So what about... Um, what makes a photograph good or even great? Why is a photograph powerful? And those of you who know me know that I believe that a couple of things. And so I'm going to share some philosophy, which I often do. I believe that creative number one is who you are, not how you feel. That's an important lesson. Yes, we can have creative feelings and feelings like we're not creative or feelings like our mojo is on and our mojo is off. But that does not dictate whether or not you are creative. You're born creative. You can't help it. Creativity is actually taught out of us by the time we leave high school for many people. I'm going to bring that comment up. Gary will get back to that. So creativity is who you are. That's my core belief. Gary says a good photograph is the level of grain in a photo. It makes it great. Yeah. He read something like that somewhere on the internet. So it must be true. I'll get to that. Uh, Marilyn, hello. Bruno, hello. Thank you for joining. You guys are making my day. Like I'm, I'm now talking to everybody I already know and I'm, I'm less nervous. I think in the future I'm going to have to get a bouncer in here. Maybe Paul Burke can moderate for me in case we get trolls, which is like my biggest, it's way up there on the fear level. Anyway. Um, so what makes a great photograph? Are you guys, do you guys want to see a short presentation? It's a truncated presentation of what's the point that some of you have seen, but I don't think I can talk about this without talking about physiologically, biologically as humans, what we're drawn to naturally, what we have to see, like we can't help but see certain things. And then how these things go together to make images that, that I hope people find powerful or attractive or that connect with them emotionally, or tell a story. So um, I am going to break into this little PowerPoint, uh, and I'll try and keep it as short and quick as possible. But I want to make this point. What makes a good photograph? Because that really is the premise of most of what I teach. And I don't predominantly teach the how-to, although it, it comes along with what I teach, and I teach the why-to. And so some of that why-to is connected to human psychology. And so I'm going to move on to that. But first and foremost, what I tell um, everybody that I teach is that, and I want you to all remember this. You ready for it? Story trumps technique. So what's the difference between this camera and this camera, besides about $7,000? Well, really, it's technology. It's the level of technology and the number of pixels and how much light it can successfully record quickly. Um, that's, that's really one of the biggest differences. But they're both incredible, incredible tools. Yeah, it does have a lens cap on. Yeah, yeah I'll take that off. That reminds me of a story. <laughs> I can't help but tell stories. Do you want to know 
why photography is so addictive for me. I think almost every photographer I've met has an issue with distractibility, attention, and the dopamine hit. It's what we love about social media and comments. I'll show you. So what dr dr attracts me to this camera, this camera is really, really good at satisfying my need for dopamine, and I'll show you why. Um, when I'm taking a picture and I'm doing it slowly, it's like therapy. Um, do you know Harley Davidson's tune their mufflers to sound like Harley Davidson's? They tune them. And I have a feeling that Nikon tunes their shutter sound. You ready for this? Listen. Oh. See, right there, this dopamine hit just went right up into my head and endorphins got released and it was like, wow, that was incredible. So that, that sound is pretty substantial to me. But if I'm having a really low day, what I do is um, I put it on my continuous low setting. That sound, right, Marjorie? See, you. everyone's going to feel good. Ready for this one? Here's a good one. Ready? So on continuous low, this is for your, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, I'm not feeling it kind of days. Ready? <laughs> I, oh, that just... Like that's, that's intense. But what you pay the big bucks for, this is what you pay the big bucks for. Here you go, you ready for this? That is why they added sound, <laughs> that sound to the phone. I gotta, I gotta pull that one up. Oh my goodness. Yeah, here, sorry. There you go, Paul. I like that, that comment. <laughs> and uh, my happy insides, here you go. These are, these are so good. Um, did that pop up? It didn't come up. Oh, no. Oh, well, there we go. So you ready for this one? So Nikon D5, uh, the sport and wildlife photographer's dream camera. Here, here it goes. Oh, I'm, I'm good for a week. That's it. I'm good. So I'm going to tell you. Story trumps technique. This camera is better than the cameras that made many people famous just 50 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago. It does a better job, captures more dynamic range and has better resolution than most average film cameras on a phone. Yeah. And so it's not about the technology. It's not the technique. Story is everything. And then we get into these other parts. So, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I got this stuff. I'm going to switch over to my presentation and um, uh, I'm going to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, and, but I really want to communicate this because I think people love pictures. And this is this is where I come at photography. So if you want to know a little bit more about me, uh, this is kind of where I come at it from. So I'm just going to move a couple of things around so I can still see. I still see some comments if I need them. Ah. And so I actually have to cut to that, don't I? Hey, technology works again. It's fantastic. Just throw up in the comments to make sure that I actually did this right and you actually can see uh, see those. Uh, uh, I actually can. No, no, not that. I'll see it in a second when they pop up. But I'm going to trust that this is working. That's what you have to do when you're live, right? What's the port point? This is a tongue-in-cheek question. What is the point? The art and theory of directing viewer engagement and creating powerful images. And so I want to say this. Uh, the great masters of our imagination don't make things up out of thin air, but they direct our attention to what is right before our eyes. And with their help, we see it not as commonplace, but as magnificent and not as time-worn but is timeless. And what's interesting is that's not just for the elite or the special people. That's for everyone that takes a picture. Everyone that has a phone or a camera. They're making things magnificent out of things that are right before us. And of course, you can get better at it. Some are better at it. That just takes practice. Oh, I'm glad you can see, Gary. He sees. He sees. Hey, Gary, I like your avatar picture. 
Gary, it's getting a little long in the tooth, though. That was way, way back in one of the first Google photo walks, wasn't it? With the city in the background. Three important takeaways from this quick presentation. One, remember these. The area of highest contrast is something you can't help but look at, and I'm going to prove it. Color contrast is very powerful, though I don't want to spend too much time there. And my favorite of all things, if there's one thing I can leave with you today, it's that simplicity is power. Okay. This is not the greatest image I've ever taken, but it makes a point. What's the first thing you look at? And I would have to suggest that the first thing you may look at is the face of the cow, followed by the number 13, and then probably here to that more negative space at that laughing cow in the background. These are things that, that you may look at first. And why do you look at that first? Because you're drawn to the area of highest contrast. You can't help but look there. You're physically wired to do that. And if it didn't happen right away, it will happen. So most often, the area of highest contrast comes forward. It grabs our attention, just like that lettering did right there. So look at this lion. You know what's unique about our eyes? When we have a catch light, and the catch light is that little light speck in our eyes, and that's why photographers love to record catch lights, especially birding photographers. But in wildlife, getting a catch light gives life to the eyes. But you notice that our eyes always have, like, like to, we like to see a catch light, and our, our pupil is black. So that would be white against black. That's literally the area of highest contrast, the thing we have to look at. Now, there's a lot of other reasons we look at eyes. Eyes are the window to the soul. But isn't it interesting that in the eyes design, that area of highest contrast is right in front of us. We have to look at another person's eyes. What's really great also is that that area around the pupil is colored with many colors. Amber, dark, black, brown, blue, green, um, all kinds of colors. And so it gives us unique character. But I want to show you something else to prove this area of highest contrast. This image is, is riveting. You have to look at the eyes. But if we, if we take a look at the next image, same lion, but you're going to look at two things in this image. Two things. You're going to look at the eyes and then areas of detail when they're associated to highest contrast. So you're going to see whiskers and that dribble down the chin. You have to look there. You can't not look there. So the, the first thing you might have looked at was actually the dribble because it's a larger area of high contrast. But then back to the eyes, then down to the dribble and the whiskers, and then back to the eyes. Only briefly looking around the image to make sense of the fact that it's a beautiful lioness. <clears throat> so very often a photographer or an artist is going to tell you light areas come forward and dark areas recede. And that's a half truth. So I'm going to break that rule in a second. But here at Watkins Glen, that rule applies. I edited this with drama. And so the waterfall, we have to look at it. And then we look at just a little bit of detail I left on the rocks to make sense of this picture visually. But what about this? <gasps> Puppies! Who doesn't love a puppy? The area of highest contrast here is the dark puppy against the light puppies and white background. And the, the dark area actually came forward to you. And so that's proof that the rule isn't that light areas come forward and dark areas recede, although that is often the case. The truth is that the area of highest contrast in the image is the one you're going to look at. So that, that's the highest thing on the list. And here, these little, uh, little ox uh, doing some courting rituals and kissing. They have these what look like catch lights. They actually aren't. They're, they're bright white hoods on their eyelids. And so we're always looking at their eyes. And it's the area of highest contrast and simplicity and all these other things in one picture. Same thing with the eagle. The area of highest contrast here is because I waited. I was bobbing in a zodiac with a 600 millimeter lens, holding an 11 pound lens and a five pound camera bobbing in a zodiac, floating along, getting my driver to position me so that I had a darker background behind the head of the adolescent bald eagle to make this image. By the way, for those of you talking about noise, I wanted to get to this Gary Monroe. This image is shot at 10,000 ISO. And um, it's why there's compressed color and it makes it look painterly. And I'm really pleased with the image. 
Polar bears, who doesn't love a polar bear? Area of highest contrast is where? In his face. We all know this rule. But here, the dark areas come forward, the light area recedes. Isn't that interesting? And look at dribble on the chin, something I love to capture. One more. Um, it's all, all, often not obvious. One of my favorite photographs of polar bears is this one because it's actually more true to how you're likely to see a polar bear in the wilderness. Polar bears live a very solitary lifestyle, except when they're with their mom for two years. This polar bear is probably in its beginning of its second year. This was the beginning of summer in Svalbard, north of the Arctic Circle. And we, we couldn't get very close to these bears uh, because of ice. And so I was taking photographs from the deck of our ship and uh, they were about a kilometer away. And I thought this was actually more representative of the true story of a bear than perhaps the close up of the bear. But they both tell a story. Do you see how stories uh, trump everything? That area of highest contrast in the middle of that empty space over here. And let's quickly move along. Similar, penguins. Who doesn't love penguins? Thank you. I'm glad you love the pics. Um, penguins, these penguins are arriving on a rookery early in the season before the snow is even melted off the rocks. But the detail mixed with area of highest contrast. So this idea of small, fine details that we're attracted to. It's why letters or, or words or numbers attract us also on a page. But these fine details, we know immediately these are penguins, even though we can't really see them that close. And then just before I move on, I wanted to include this picture. What makes a picture powerful or good? This picture I don't think is powerful or good. I think it's an average picture because it, I had this image in my mind, that bucket list shot of these northern gannets isolated from their background, kind of that National Geographic picture. And at, at this image was probably around 300 millimeters and I wasn't quite getting it what I, how I wanted. Even though the background was soft and the foreground was sharp, uh, like a lot of streamers want their cameras to do. <laughs> what I did was I actually switched to a 600 millimeter lens and even wider aperture to arrive at this picture which I think is a powerful image. And it also introduces idea number two, color contrast. Who knows that blue and orange are color contrasts. So this blue and this buff orange color are opposites. And so not only do we have the area of highest contrast around the beaks, but we have color contrast. So opposites attract. Let's look at that color contrast. Opposites, if you have a color wheel and if you don't, you can just pull one up on Google, say artists color wheel. The opposite color is on the other side of the wheel. So when we had that buff orange, the opposite of that is blue. If you have green, the opposite is red. If you have purple, the opposite is violet. This is a great example of that, this petunia. So we have this yellow color against violet. Those are color opposites on the color wheel. We have this greenish color against this red magenta color, also color opposites. And guess where the area of highest contrast resides? at exactly what you have to look at. Isn't that cool? So if we look back at that picture, notice this color, and look here at this color, and then look down here. Whoops, hit the wrong arrow. And look here, see that opposite on that color wheel? It's sitting right there, and over to here, and over to here, and over to here. So color opposites are important. An important thing to know about the color brown or rust is it's actually in the orange family. And so orange and blue are opposites. So brown and blue are opposites. Isn't that fascinating? Favorite Christmas colors, opposites, red and green. So these all contribute to making more powerful images. Here it's not quite as obvious. There's a great story behind this, but I'm not going to take up any more of your time on stories for this part. But it was minus 18. Georgian Bay had not frozen yet and the winds were 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. It was bitingly cold. The color opposite here is orange and blue, even though they're subtle or softer. And so we, we see the oranges up here in that subtle range and the blue in the subtle range. These two black-browed albatross are in um, uh, Falkland Islands off Argentina, down in the south. I'm isolating them. I'm using a technique known as simplicity, which we're about to jump to. And um, 
I just want to, no, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so that's that's what I'll do. I wanted to know if I could actually see my slides and, and scan through to, to jump. Yeah, I can, good, so I can push forward. So this image, pardon me for taking that short break. Janine, hello. Oh, you know what, Janine, if you guys have enough internet, I would love to interview one of you guys or, or all of you together. Janine from South Africa. Everybody who's watching, Janine Crayer is part of a team in South Africa, Pangolin Photo Safaris. I'm going to shout you out. And they run the absolutely best safari outfit in Botswana, maybe in all of Africa. And uh, that image of the lion was taken while I was out there. Back to my story. Two black-browed albatross. Notice the catch light in the eye. The area of highest contrast sits right here. It's blue against orange. I could tell the story about how often I'm lying with my chin in the dirt or in bird guano or penguin guano or seal crap, but we won't get into that, but you get the picture. So um, I'm going to move on to a, a concept called simplicity is power. And this is the final aspect. So we have area of highest contrast. Here, I'm just going to cut over and I'm going to, I'm going to speak directly to you guys. Oh, thanks, Mary Studio. I appreciate it. I'm going to pull that comment up. Thank you very much. That gives me a great deal of encouragement. And thank you for letting me know about the sound as well. So back to our regular scheduled program, simplicity is power. Um, this one's really important. So we talked about the area of highest contrast, black against white, white against black, dark against light, light against dark. We have to look at that. The second one was color contrasts or opposite. I encourage you to download the artist color wheel from Google and look at the opposites. And the fundamental or main ones are red to green, yellow to violet, and blue to orange. And you'll see in my work, in a lot of my work, you're going to say, oh, Ron, you're so predictable because I do it all the time. And finally, simplicity is power. And so here's what I would love to communicate. Simplicity is power. Um, if there's one thing that you remember from this, it's that when you're holding your camera, whether it be a, a cell phone or an expensive camera, when you can simplify your image, you can create a more powerful image. So I'm going to come back to this uh, one more time. I know I'm bending your ear and you're staying with me a long time and I appreciate it. We're almost done. The artist looks at a blank canvas and if they're like me, they get scared. But they look at a blank canvas and they ask themselves this question. What can I do? What can I add to this blank canvas to make a powerful image? The photographer, also an artist, asks themselves a very different question. They say to themselves, what can I take away from everything that's in front of me to make a powerful image? You see, it's, it's a very different approach. We're, we're isolating. We're taking away. We're trying to find the main character. We're trying to find the thing that tells the story. So here we go. Simplicity is power. So in this picture of a penguin, it's very simple. There's not much to it. It's a penguin. It's a close-up. Penguin, humdy dum -de dum he's walking along. Interestingly, I have the white of his eye, not the catch light, unfortunately, although I think I have a little one. The white of his eye, which is really, really rare to see in a penguin because they actually have to look a bit to the side to be able to see the whites of a penguin's eye. And so there, simplicity. But what if you could make it even more simple? So this image displays penguin in a way maybe nobody has thought of or seen. So just the beak. And notice in nature, we see the opposite here. There's a bluish tinge in the beak and orange, blue and orange right there. There's a blue there, orange there. And of course, our areas of highest contrast and detail. We, we have all the things happening. This speaks for itself. Uh, Arctic tern hovering, waiting to dive down into the water. A northern gannet hovering, waiting to dive down into the water. So the the simplicity, like the isolation, like how simple can you make the image and still tell the story? Here, a northern fulmar, 
the timing on this image, we worked hard. Um, if you're still here, Lori Novak, you were there. You were on that trip. You, for a while, were standing beside me while I was photographing into the that oil-like sunsetish 24-hour day of the Arctic at these northern fulmars. What I was shooting for was actually to get a northern fulmar in the sun's reflection, but the sun's reflection was just one little spot, and so I actually invested a long time. I think I shot until one in the morning, because the sun is still out at one in the morning, until I finally got it, and here it is here. What I love about this image is that area of highest contrast, probably actually the shadow or the reflection, but uh, the way that dark is against the light here and the, the light is against the dark. and I, I love this image. Anyway, the artist in me. I'm going to move on. Tell your story. Uh, parasitic skuas don't like to hunt for themselves. They actually like to terrify kittiwakes until they regurgitate their food and then steal it. And that's what this animal is doing. He is he is pestering and terrifying this kittiwake to cough up the meal he just ate and succeeded. I didn't get that picture. And uh, I'll show you one more and I'll probably do a little bit of skipping ahead. This image isn't sharp. And it's actually a tight crop because 400 millimeters just wasn't enough to capture these birds. We we're actually photographing a walrus haulout and there were mating turns and we could hear them fly over us and they were in the air above us and I turned quickly with my my telephoto lens and I, I captured this image and I, I love this image because story trumps technique it's grainy and it's not perfectly sharp but does it tell a story the two birds locked beaks locked in mid-air and if you you know how fast this unfolded it I'm so happy with this image and uh, the final thing I think I, I might leave you with is the idea to make powerful images, because I can go on and on and on, is this idea of silhouettes. And so here again, this is, this is Chobi River, Botswana, and uh, the silhouette, exposing for the silhouette. So intentionally underexposing, which gives the sky, even though it was just around sunset, and you can see the sunset hitting the side of the trees over here, by uh, slightly underexposing, not getting a bright sky, uh, I'm able to create that silhouette. Silhouettes of cormorants, and this is in Newfoundland, and uh, a place called Bird Island. Go figure. You know how hard it is to get birds to cooperate and line up in a row and all look in the same direction? He can be here, it's okay. Shadow just came into the room. But I don't have my shadow cam on. So silhouettes create powerful images because they simplify. You see, a reindeer. Even though the reindeer takes up maybe a 500th of the image, we all know it's a reindeer picture, you know. Uh, simplify. Simplify. Uh, my first polar bear and uh, the way he's backlit against the backdrop. And it's very simple, but it tells the whole story. We have the Arctic tundra. We have glacial mountain-like uh, background and gray sky. That's that's the whole story. That's the Arctic right there. So um, I'm just thinking about what I want to leave you with. I think I want to leave you with this idea. Uh, the idea that yes, simplicity is power. Um, yes, that contrasts are important, like the, this area of high contrast, but uh, you got to do your own thing, just like this penguin's doing. You know, sing like no one's watching, dance like, no, sing like no one's listening, dance like no one's watching. I think that's really important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with that saying I started with. Think about this. The great masters of imagination do not make things out of thin air. They direct our attention to what is right before our eyes. And with their help, we see it not as commonplace, but as magnificent and not as time-worn, but as timeless. Thank you for watching my presentation on what makes a powerful image. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. I, I'm here for you guys. Uh, and this is the Q&A period of everything. And I'm open to hearing what you got to say. Uh, 
thanks, my happy insights. I'm glad you loved it. Um, that's actually one of my favorite presentations of all time. It's a shortened version. I thought it would only be about 15 minutes, but clearly I think it was longer. I'm terrible at telling the time. Anyway, thank you, Paul Burke. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I really enjoy giving that presentation and helping people, not just people with cameras, but people with phones and, and devices to make better images. Yeah, when we put the camera to our eye, um, I think the most important lesson is ask yourself, what story am I telling? And how can I simplify what's in front of me to tell it? It's a very powerful way to photograph things. And use your feet to zoom in. Definitely use your feet to zoom in. Definitely. I hope it's my first live of many, Marjorie. Um, I guess I'll, I'll create a regular schedule and I'll probably even do recorded videos and just pop them onto my channel regardless. And it, it probably won't always be about photography, but it'll definitely always, I'll always relate stories to it, I'm sure. I was saying to Paul Burke, who's here just the other day, probably yesterday, um, I always say this, I always say, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> because it does always remind me of a story. I thought that would be a good name for a channel, but uh, maybe just a good name for an episode or two, because things always do remind me of a story. Uh, I have a great question here. I'm curious uh, how these translate with photographing people and if, if there are different elements to consider. Yeah, um, photographing people, a lot of people find it extremely challenging, my happy insights, and are intimidated by portraiture. Um, even when I started in portraiture, and that was a long time ago, um, I was very intimidated because I, I didn't understand how to make people look their best. So I would say things like, oh, I don't pose. I'm just a natural. I, I like to do candid photography. Well, I, I did like and I do like to do candid photography, but some of that was hiding my fear of not knowing how to make somebody look natural, even though I posed them, if that makes any sense. And so when photographing people, I would suggest, number one, Try to get to their eye level, especially like kids. You know, you're photographing kids or dogs. Shoot um, often at or just just slightly above eye level with some adults, but try to get eye level photographs of somebody sitting. Don't stand over them and take their picture, but get at eye level. And then I find my most successful images are not when immediately when I try to get a smile from someone, like I'll say, okay, one, two, three, photograph. No, it's the moment after they think that you're finished. So, so my best trick is actually for that moment when they let their guard down, when they're not ready for it. That's when you get the really good storytelling images. When they break into a laugh or they do something that they thought was embarrassing and then they, they're caught off guard. Thanks for joining, Wendy. Thanks. No, no problem. Run, run because you have to. That's great. Oh, I'm so glad, uh, Marilyn, uh, that I kept your interest because it's always challenging because I went longer than I had hoped to in my first live. Yes. So I hope that helps, uh, Kat. Um, yeah, catch that moment after the moment that they were prepared for you to take their picture is a really good tip on taking pictures of people. And avoid taking pictures of people leaning back, but rather just ask them to lead forward a bit, much like I do when I'm presenting live. Um, I'm going to cut this off. Uh, I really appreciate you guys joining me in investing time. Uh, it means an awful lot to me. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to do because all lives should have this. I don't have my, I do have a subscribe button I tried out, but I got this. A subscribe and a reminder. Set the reminder. There you go. There, that's my high tech for the day because I said I was going to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> that was kind of goofy. Thanks for watching, you guys, and I'll see you guys in the stream.